Let's give him a round of applause. Stand with us, please. You may be seated. So good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Glad you are here to uh, worship uh, and celebrate with us. I believe God has some great things planned 
this morning and uh, so glad that you're here. Uh, I know we've got several folks that are here for the very first time. We want to welcome you, especially as honored guests, and uh, want to, would encourage you, if you would, there's a connection card right there in the seat back in front of you. If you take just a moment and fill that out, and then you can place it in our offering box located at the uh, four-year entrance, or you can give that to me on your way out this morning. Either way, we'd love to have that record of you being here. You can also uh, do this electronically electronically cbcdeerpark.org if you'd rather do it on your mobile device either way we just love to be able to reach out to you this week and know who you are but uh, we're glad that you are here uh, you'll notice this side of the uh, front part of our auditorium is a little empty this morning we have around 40 uh, young people and youth leaders. They are on their way back uh, from Escape. This is an annual event they do where they get away on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning and just dive into the Word of God and in worship and in fellowship and, then of course, some fun and games, uh, but to, to just to grow our, our teenagers in their walk with the Lord. And so they're traveling back this morning. We're going to hear testimonies Wednesday night of their weekend experience, but I do want to share this with you. Uh, as of last night, and I don't know about their service this morning, but as of last night, we had six of our young people commit their lives to Christ for salvation this weekend, and, uh, and we thank God for that. The Lord is working in our midst. He's working in our teens, and, uh, and we believe that God's going to do things here this morning as well. And so we want to go, Lord, in a word of prayer. And uh, as we pray, Brother Steve Hines is going to lead us today. As he prays, I want to encourage you uh, to pray along with him and just ask God to speak to your heart this morning. He has a word for you. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're facing. He knows the encouragement that you need, the direction, the counsel, if you'll just be open today to hear his voice. Brother Steve, lead us in prayer this morning. Father, I come to you, Lord. I just want to thank you and praise you, Father, for what you've done with the youth this weekend, Father. Lord, I thank you, Father, for the six souls, Father, that at least six souls have turned their lives over to you, Father. Lord, I pray, Father, that you just be with the whole group, the adults, the students. I pray, Father, that you just give them a safe journey back to Deer Park, Father. Lord, I thank you, Father, for that time, Lord. Father, I pray that you just be with us now as we prepare to worship you, Lord. Lord, we just uh, lift our eyes to you, Father, and want to praise you, Father, for all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray, Father, that you just be with our pastor this morning, Lord. Just lift him up. Use him, Lord. Lord, I pray for the music, Father. I pray that it prepares our heart for the words that you have to come to us, Father. Lord, I just want to thank you and praise you, Father, for this beautiful day you give us. I thank you for loving us and sending your son for us to die in our place, Father. Lord, I thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. Lord, I just want to praise you again for all that you've done for us, Lord, and what you're going to do in days ahead, Father. Lord, I just pray we just give it all to you, Lord. May you have your way today, Father. Lord, I just ask this in all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's rise and continue to lift our voices in worship.
side The heroes of the fair With one voice A thousand generations Sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain And on that day We join the resurrection We stand beside i 
I love the truth of that song. That the name of hope is Jesus. We know that Jesus is the answer for what's going on in our world today. And, uh, you know, we, we use this time or have been using this time to pray for revival. And we understand that revival only comes in the name of Jesus. And I'm sure that most everybody is at least somewhat familiar with some of the reports of what's going on around our nation right now, uh, things that are being billed as revivals, things on college campuses, I believe, starting there at a little school in Kentucky, uh, with now going on a multitude of days of, of just nonstop worship and prayer and preaching. That spreading to other campuses and other groups and seeing pictures of literally hundreds of young people on their knees at an altar before an almighty God. Praying and repenting and getting right and it's encouraging to see. And probably if you have watched or kept up with any of that stuff, you'll, you'll know that there's both a lot of, a lot of praise and celebration uh, for what's happening. There's also a lot of criticism uh, from others as to what's happening. There are a lot of skeptics that wonder, could this be true, or is this just emotionalism, or whatever. But I want to share this with you. Regardless of what's going on, we see God at work. We have prayed for and asked God to bring revival to our land. Now, the reality is we're not the only church asking God to do that. The reality is, is that no man can manufacture the moving of God upon people. And that which God begins to do, no man can stop if it's the work of His hand. What we need to remember this morning is that revival comes when there's worship. When we praise the Creator of all the universe. When we humbly bow ourselves before Him and we worship Him, it prepares us. But with revival, not only must there be worship, there also must be the Word. The Word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. Worship prepares our hearts to receive the Word. And when the Word comes to us, it penetrates. And then for, for revival to take place as worship happens around the Word of God, the Word of God begins to convict and repentance then follows. Confession is made. People fall on their face before an almighty God and they, they get up and begin to change. Because revival is about a re-sparking of the Spirit, a renewal of the Spirit that we truly get right with God and then we go forth and we are different. The fruit of revival is not seen in the moment of the excitement and the sensationalism that takes place in that moment where the, where the Spirit of God is moving mightily. The proof is when we leave that place different. And friend, that's the desire we have this morning. I'm thrilled to see what's going on around our nation. I'm thrilled to see what God is doing here because revival might look different in different contexts. We have seen, I believe, revival this weekend with our young people. Six salvations being made. That's revival. We will continue to see and should continue to ask God to revive us. And remember, revival starts with you. It can happen in the context of hundreds, but it also can happen in the context of just you before an almighty God in this moment. That God can revive us every day. That every day we worship Him. Every day we are challenged and changed by His Word. That every day we go forth and live as children of God, as lights in the darkness. That's revival.
Brother Alan Stake's going to lead us in prayer. We're going to pray as we have been for a long time that God would bring revival to us, starting in our own lives, starting in our church, but also all around our nation, that God would begin to bring in the spirit of revival, that we would return to Him. Brother Alan, lead us in prayer. Grace to me, Father, Lord. Uh, Lord, first and foremost, I just want to thank you for you. Thank you for being there for us, Lord. Uh, Lord, taking, taking the time that you did to come down to this earth and experience what we experience. Lord, that so we would know that when we went to you that you would do and say in things the things that you said you would do. Lord, I thank you for my pastor today as he keeps up with what's going on. Lord, I, I had not heard that. But Lord, I thank you for it. Lord, I thank you for that revival that he's seeing, that he's sharing uh, with us about. Lord, uh, in the lesson today, we, we talked about you praying and how you prayed. And Lord, uh, again, we talked about the examples that you set for us. Lord, and you set the ultimate example uh, of sacrifice and giving up of yourself, Lord. And Lord, that you sat there and you prayed for yourself and you prayed for the men that were with you. And then you prayed for all believers, Lord, and that's us. And so, Lord, we acknowledge who you are, and we ask in your name, Lord, that uh, Lord, that a revival would start in myself and each one of us, Lord. Lord, that we, be, we would become excited once again about you and the work that you've done. And, Lord, that that excitement would spread to one another and from one another outside of this church. And, Lord, again, thank you for the opportunities that you're going to give us to come together as a group of churches tonight. Lord, and, uh, Lord, if you see fit tonight, to start it right then. Lord, as we hit, listen, as we praise and worship, listen to the preachers as they talk to us. Lord, if it be your will that we go out of here and a revival start tomorrow in Deer Park, Lord, we just ask you to do your will. But Lord, most of all, we want you to be with us today. Lord, and we want you to touch uh, each and every one of us. Um, Lord, clear our hearts and our heads that we may focus on what you have to say to us today. Lord, that we'd hear it We'd act on it, and Lord, most of all, that someone may come to, to know you today even before they leave this place. Lord, we're excited about what you've done at camp. Lord, we thank you for our teachers. Lord, the ones that are going up there with, them, up there with the youth. Lord, I thank you for the youth. Lord, I just ask you to be with them, touch them. Lord, when, we, when they get home, Lord, that we be encouragers to them. Lord, we shake their hand and be excited about it. Lord, if we're not excited, Lord, how could they be excited? Lord, help us to show that. Help us to be the example that we should be. Lord, we love you today and we need you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Listen, we have one more song before we get into the Word. And I want you to rise to your feet and realize, understand, what we're doing when we sing, we are, we are worshiping. We're not just filling time for our service. We are, we are worshiping. And it's an opportunity to prepare our hearts to hear from an almighty God. So I encourage you this morning to worship with everything that is within you.
Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to begin in Proverbs chapter 20, and we'll look at several other passages as well, but Proverbs 20 is where we'll start this morning, and uh, uh, many of you know we are we're in a series talking about being conformed into the image of God. We know the Apostle Paul gives us this, this admonition, uh, and Scripture clearly teaches that God not only created us for relationship, but God created us that we might be like Him that we might uh, reflect His character and His nature and His image to the world around us in which we live. And so we spent many months at the end of last year uh, talking about the, the, uh, the, the nature and the character of God. And we got into Scripture and we looked at all the different attributes that God possesses and that God declares about Himself. And of course, God carries all of these attributes uh, in absolute perfection. Uh, and we know that we cannot be perfect in these things, but we ought to be striving to be the best that we can. And through the power of God working in us, we can develop these traits in our lives that we see perfectly reflected in an almighty God. And so we've been looking at them one by one over the last several weeks, and uh, and we have considered already the fact that we are to love as God loves. We've considered that we are to be holy as the Lord is holy, meaning that we're to be set apart and different and separated from the rest of the world. Uh, we talked last week about how God has called us to do good, and the only way to do good is to be good, and the only way to be good is to be in right relationship with Jesus, and we are to reflect His goodness in everything that we do, and so we're beginning to see how we should take on these characteristics of Christ and hopefully live them out in our everyday life. These are very practical messages for you and I of how we ought to be and how we ought to behave ourselves in the world in which we live. And because many of these things, although they can be expressed by, uh, by non-believers and by, by people of the world, they cannot be expressed to their fullness and to their greatness unless you're in right relationship with Jesus. And if you're in right relationship with Jesus, then these things ought to just naturally be reflected in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the next character trait, and that is the character trait of being faithful. Uh, you'll remember we talked about the faithfulness of God. Again, this has been several months ago, and we understand that God is faithful in absolutely everything that He does. We came to realize, I gave you this definition several months ago, that faithfulness uh, is, is showing uh, it's being completely steadfast. It is to be faithful. Firm. It is to be stable. When somebody is faithful, you know that they can be counted on in every situation, in every circumstance, because a faithful one never quits. A faithful one never gives up. A faithful one never leaves you high and dry. A faithful one is there through good and through bad, through thick and through thin. A faithful person you know you can always count on. And we serve a God that is a faithful God, that we know without a doubt we can always count on His presence, we can always count on His power, we can always count on His wisdom, we can always count on the fact that He will always do the right thing. God is faithful. The reality is we are called also to be faithful. Go to Proverbs chapter 20. In verse number 6, and we're going to see here in, uh, in Solomon's wisdom, he makes, a very, uh, he makes a very pointed statement at the very beginning, and he asks, asks a very uh, important question. He says this, he says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. 
but. You know, when you somebody uses that word but, it usually means you need to stop and think about some things, right? Because he said, listen, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Solomon had, uh, you know, he'd been around, uh, he'd been on the earth for a little while when he wrote these words, and he had the Spirit of God inspiring him as he wrote these words. And what he understood about the nature of mankind is that we're all really good about patting ourselves on the back, aren't we? Uh, It's easy often for us to talk about how good we think that we really are. It's good to brag about our our abilities and our knowledge and our experiences. It's easy for us to do that. It's easy for us to find ourselves in a situation where maybe we weren't faithful to somebody. And it's easy for us to talk about and justify why we took the position that we did and why we left the person that we left and why we didn't complete the task that we were sent to complete. It's easy for us to talk about why we're not faithful and to do it in a way where we pat ourselves on the back and make everybody else think that we were good even though we failed to be faithful. Y'all with me? Anybody ever experienced that? Maybe you uh, and no, no, maybe about it. We're all guilty of that to a degree. The Word of God says that every man can proclaim his own goodness, but he said, but then he says, but, but a faithful man, who can find? You see, what Solomon is getting at as he makes the statement, he's bringing us to the reality that it's easy for us to praise ourselves. It's easy for us to talk about how good we think we are. But Solomon says, but really, who can find somebody that's actually faithful? I believe that Solomon is giving some some implication to us that faithfulness in humanity, number one, it's a rarity, but number two, it's an important thing for us to have because the reality is, is we are all looking for faithful people in our lives. Anybody, Anybody like to do business or be in a relationship with somebody that's not faithful? Right? We don't like that. We don't look for that. We're looking for faithful people. And as we look for faithful people, guess what? We have to be a faithful person. So who can find somebody that's faithful? And listen, we we can look at our society today and we realize that faithfulness is not the virtue that it ought to be. I mean, just think about this. Think about the divorce rate. In the United States of America, why is the divorce rate at an all-time high? Because people aren't faithful. Why does CPS in Texas have more kids than they know what to do with? Because parents aren't faithful. Why is cohabitation at an all-time high? Because people are afraid to commit themselves in faithfulness to one another. Why do we hear story after story of people that are let go from a company they have served their entire life because they're now too old and no longer an asset? It's because people don't understand what it means to be faithful. Why is it that the back door of the church is as open and broad as the front door with people changing churches every few months or every couple of years is because people don't understand what it means to be faithful. We're not faithful because we're not reflecting the image and likeness of God. If we are reflecting His image, we are going to be a faithful people. Now, the first thing I want you to understand this morning is that when it comes to faithful, and, and as Solomon asked the question, a faithful man who can find, I would hope by, uh, by the end of this morning that we could all raise our hand and say, listen, I want to be the faithful one that somebody can find. That when people that know you and look at you, that they can look at you and say, hey, that individual is going to be faithful. And I want you to understand, when it comes to being faithful, we have to be faithful in absolutely every area of our life. We have to be faithful in every area of our life. As a child of God, there's not any part of our life 
that we're not responsible to be faithful in. Right, so this means we need to be faithful, number one, in our relationship to an almighty God. Right, we need to be faithful in how we relate to God, how we worship God, how we spend time with God. But we also ought to be faithful in every relationship that we have with mankind. There ought to be faithfulness going on in our homes between husbands and wives. There ought to be faithfulness going on in our homes between parents and children. There ought to be faithfulness in the relationships that we have with the people that live in our neighborhood, that, 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 that live around us. There ought to be faithfulness in our relationships with the people that we work with or the people that we go to school with. There ought to be a faithfulness to us in, in, in how we are with the people of our community in which we live. And there has to be faithfulness in, uh, in not only in our relationships, but there ought to be faithfulness in our resources, how we handle our finances, what we do with our possessions. Faithfulness in what we do with the abilities that God has given us, the, the, the skill of our hand and the knowledge of our heads, that we are faithful with what we have. And understand that when it comes to being faithful in every area, realize that God has given you different areas of responsibility. He's given you different uh, abilities. He's given you different relationships. And whatever thing God has given you, whether it's a little or a lot, God expects you to be faithful. You go to Matthew chapter number 25 and verses 14 through 30. We find there where Jesus gives a parable, a teaching. And he gives this teaching to illustrate the truth or the importance of faithfulness. And I'm not going to read the, the verses for you this morning. I want to paraphrase for you what's going on. Jesus says, listen, here's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Here's what God's children should be like. He said, he said it's like this, this rich master that was going to go away on a journey. And he said, this master, he, he, he calls unto him his three, his three servants, the uh, three men that have served him and, uh, and followed him. And he says that he gave to each man some talents. It says he gave to the first man five talents, to the second man three talents, and to the first man one talent. And, and I want you to notice, first of all, that he gave them different amounts. And the scripture says that he did so according to their ability. Meaning that God gave them different things because He knew He could trust them at different levels. But the reality is, is it didn't have anything to do with the amount of what they were given. What, what, the, what the Master was looking for was what they did with what they had. And we find in the parable that the man with five talents went and he turned that in and he made five talents more. The man with three did the same. He, he went and traded those and was wise and he got three talents more. The man with the one talent, the Bible says, he just went and buried it in the earth. And when the master came back, he wanted to know what they had done with what they had been given. And, and, and the first guy with five talents comes and says, listen, I took what you gave me and I multiplied it. And the master said, well done, thou good and faithful servant the, the the man with the three talents came did the same thing and the master says hey well done you good and faithful servant the other guy came and he brought the one talent that the master had given him and said look i know what kind of man you are i hid this one in the ground i didn't do anything with it and the master said listen you're you're a, you're a wicked servant to me take what you had give it to the man with five because you've not been faithful the point of Jesus' parable is He is getting us to understand that God has entrusted things to us. And whatever He has entrusted you with, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot, He expects that you are faithful. That means that if God has given you a relationship as a husband and wife, God expects that in that relationship, you're faithful. If God has given you any kind of position at work, whether you're blue collar or whether you're white collar, He expects that you be faithful. If God has given you a church to be a part of, He expects that in that church you be faithful. If He's given you any kind of resource, any kind of skill, any kind of ability, any kind of spiritual gifting, God expects that in that thing you be 
faithful. And the reality, my friend, is this, is if we, if we are faithful in every area but one, then we're not really being faithful. And so I want to encourage you this morning, begin to examine your life and to see what God has put in your hands. What relationships do you have? What opportunities are before you? What responsibilities fall on your shoulders? And are you being faithful with what God has entrusted you with? And it doesn't matter, again, if you've been entrusted with a little or with a lot. God expects you to be faithful with what you have. And if you can't be faithful with what God has already given you, then don't expect Him to bless you with anything else. Because the Christian life really revolves around being faithful. When you read the New Testament and you read about believers in the New Testament church, you will find that one of the hallmark traits of the early Christians was that they were faithful. Remember the question in Proverbs, a faithful man who can find. And this was the hallmark. This is what believers of the New Testament church, this is something I believe they wanted to be known for. They wanted to be known as faithful. Because faithfulness set them out from the world in which they lived. They live in a world that is much like ours, a world that says be faithful only to you and nobody else. By the way, that's an unbiblical idea, to be faithful only to us. When you look at the New Testament Scriptures, you notice this phrase happening over and over again. Uh, uh, Peter talks about Silvanus. He says, calls him what? He calls him a faithful brother. By the way, when you read about these guys in the New Testament, only one time to my recollection do you find somebody being called good, and that's Stephen. It says he was a good man. You know, we like to get that title in our culture, right? We want somebody to call us good. Stephen got that, that, that proclamation. We learned last week there's not anybody that's really good. And so what we might ought to start striving for to be known as is not just a good man or a good woman, but maybe we ought to desire to be known as a faithful man or a faithful woman. Because in Scripture, Peter said about Silvanus, he's a faithful brother. Paul said about Timothy, he is faithful in the Lord. It is said of the church both at Ephesus and at Colossae when talking about the believers at large that they are faithful in Christ Jesus. Epaphras, Paul said, was a faithful minister of Christ. He said the same thing about Tychius, a faithful minister. What I want you to see is that the early church, when they looked at one another, what they were looking for was faithfulness. When people looked at their lives, they said, listen, that is, a, that is an individual that's faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about that because in these passages, that is, that is the first thing that is seen or noticed or said about these believers, that they are faithful in Christ. That means when other people looked at their lives, they realized this individual is truly following after Jesus. They are in close, intimate relationship with the Father. And their life reflects that they have been changed and saved by His grace. And because they are faithful to Christ, they then were faithful in every other area of their life. Because here's the thing, when you are faithful to Jesus, He changes you. And when you're faithful to Christ, then you can be faithful or more faithful as a husband or wife. When you're faithful to Christ, you can be more faithful as a parent. When you're faithful to Christ, you can be more faithful on the job. You can be more faithful in your community. You can be more faithful in your church. If you're not faithful to Jesus, you're going to have a hard time being faithful everywhere else. And so these believers, they were seen as being faithful. And I want you to notice that not only 
Did the church recognize their faithfulness? But I would say to you that the people of the world recognize their faithfulness as well. And I think it is important that we understand this this morning. That people are always judging your faithfulness. Now, I know people get all worked up when we say we're judging somebody and, and we misquote, misinterpret Scripture and say that we can't do that. Well, the reality is we all judge one another all day, every day. That's the way that it is. Now, we've got to be careful how we judge because Jesus said we're going to be judged by the same standard that we, that we judge others with. But we can't help but judge one another. And we need to realize that in your life, people are always judging your faithfulness. In the book of Acts, chapter number 16, we find the Apostle Paul. He is in Macedonia. He's just got there. The Spirit had led him to go there to establish a church and some ministry. And the Bible says that they are by the riverside, and there's a group of people that have gathered there for prayer. And they are worshiping, and really what's happening is some revivals taking place. And there's a a, a lady there by the name of Lydia, and and after they have prayed, and after they have had a little worship service there by the river's edge, she makes the statement to Paul. In verse number 15, she says, Listen, if you have counted me or judged me to be faithful... Then would you come into my house and abide there? I want you to notice what she said. And by the way, what happens historically in this moment is through this encounter, the church is established in Macedonia. But notice what she said, the question she said. She has been there worshiping with the Apostle Paul, and she says, Listen, if you have judged me to be faithful... Come start the church in my house. Now I want you to get the principle. If you have judged me to be faithful. You know what she understood? She understood that there were people watching her life. She understood that there were people looking at her and they knew if she was faithful or not. And we need to understand this and let's take it back to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6. What was the first, what was the question? Who can find a faithful man? The presupposition to do that was was that there are a lot of people that, that will declare their own goodness, but who can find somebody that's really faithful? You see, all this implies to us that there are people watching your life and they know whether you're faithful or not. You know, the reality is you don't have to tell your husband or wife whether or not you're faithful. They already know. You don't have to tell your kids how good of a parent you are. Whether or not you're faithful to them, because guess what? They already know. You don't have to tell your boss how good of an employee you might be. They already know if you're faithful. They are watching you. Listen, people are watching us to see how faithful we are in every area of our life. Your bank is watching to see if you're faithful with your finances. Right? The HOA is watching to see if you're faithful to cut your grass. Because people are watching to see whether or not you're faithful. And the reality is, is our faithfulness or our lack thereof is either a great part of our testimony or it's a great hindrance to our testimony. You see, as a child of God, you can't really be the light in the darkness if you fail to be faithful. And people know whether you're faithful or not because, again, we'll go back to the statement that if you're not faithful, if you fail to be faithful in one area, people are going to question your faithfulness everywhere else. 
Faithfulness is about the consistency of our life, that we show fidelity and steadfastness and firmness and that we are always there and can be counted upon. And people are always judging. That ought to be some incentive to us to say, you know what, I want to be faithful. Why? Because one day I'm going to come to the end of my life and people are going to look back and have some things to say. And I would hope that it, that it ought to be our desire that when people look at us and speak of us when we're gone, that they can simply say, you know what, they were faithful. They didn't give up when things got tough. They didn't quit on their marriage. They didn't quit on their kids. They didn't quit on their job. They didn't quit on their community. They didn't give up on their church. They were faithful. They kept persevering right into the end. They never, ever quit. People are watching. And the reality is they're looking for somebody to be faithful. Because it's not commonplace in our society. You also need to understand this. Not only are people judging whether or not we're faithful, but understand God is also judging our faithfulness. You know, we might fool some people for a little while, but we can't fool God. And He's always looking at us to see, are you faithful? I think about what God told Timothy. If you have notes, by the way, I wrote the wrong reference. I have the wrong reference on the screen. I apologize. It's 1 Timothy 1.12. 1 Timothy 1.12. Timothy giving a little bit of his testimony. And uh, he's making this, this statement. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Here's what Paul understood. Paul's saying, listen, I understand that the God of heaven looked at my life and saw that I was faithful. And because God saw that I was faithful, He enabled me to do something for Him. I understand something this morning, my friend. God's judging your faithfulness. And so that means that God knows if you are faithful in your relationship to Him. He knows your faithfulness in your relationship with Him. He knows if you are playing games. He knows if your faith is just a facade. He knows what you were doing behind closed doors. He knows where you were going. He knows whether or not you walk daily with Him. If you're in His Word, if you're in prayer, if you're listening to His voice. He knows about your relationship. He knows how faithful you are. You know, a lot of times we like to put on a show like we are something that we are not. And sometimes we can fool everybody around us when it comes to our walk with God because we look good on Sunday morning. We act like we got it all together when we're here for an hour, hour and a half. And the reality is we have no relationship with God when we leave this place. God already knows that. And God expects and God desires that you be faithful in your relationship with Him. And if you can be faithful in your relationship with Him, that will enable you to begin to be faithful in your relationship with others. Friend, I want you, I, I want you to understand something. I, in, in 25 years of ministry, I've counseled with a lot of people, and I'm not, a, I'm not a counselor. But what I have come to realize in virtually every situation in life, whether it's a marriage problem, uh, an addiction problem, a pornography problem, uh, whatever it might be, when we have those kind of issues, you know what it always goes back to? It's always a spiritual problem. 
The problem, most all of the time, and really probably all of the time, is not that you got married yourself to a sorry spouse or that you're the sorry spouse, though you might both be a little sorry. The problem is you don't have a right relationship with God. Or they don't have a right relationship with God because when you're not faithful to God, you're going to have a hard time being faithful to anybody else. And God already knows. He's judging. He's also, He knows about our relationship with others. He knows whether or not we are in faithful relationship with the people under our roof, the people of our community. God's looking at those things and determining whether or not we're faithful. And by the way, you can't expect the blessing of God in those relationships if you're not being faithful to one another. He also knows whether or not we're being faithful with our finances. I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. The Bible says uh, that, that this is true among stewards, that a man be found faithful. God expects that we are faithful with what we have. And let me tell you something, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a uh, 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 $1,000 in the bank or a million dollars in the bank. God expects you to be faithful with what you got. Doesn't matter if you're working minimum wage or you're the business owner and, and making seven figures. God says be faithful with what you have. He knows about our resources. He knows whether or not we're faithful. He also knows about our abilities. Understand that God, He's judging our faithfulness. Are we being good? Are we being faithful with what we have? God's given you some ability that He hasn't given everybody else. Right? He's given you a skill set. He's given you some gifting. He's given you some talents. And God expects us to be faithful with what He has given. Some of you, God has given you some great gift, and you're not using it at all. If we're not using what God has equipped us with, then we are failing to be faithful with what we've been entrusted. Go back to Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. God has given you these things. Understand, God has given you relationships. Look at the person you're sitting, in, uh, sitting with this morning or the people that are under your roof or the people that you work with. God's giving you relationships. He says, I want you to be faithful in them. Look at the resources that are in your pocket. God says, I've given you that. Be faithful. Look at the abilities that He has given you. God says, I, I want you to be faithful with these things. And so we understand that as God is judging, this ought, to, uh, this ought to encourage us to be faithful with whatever we have. Right, Luke chapter 16, verse number 10. I love what, what Jesus said. It's always good to pay attention to what Jesus says, right? Jesus says, He that is faithful in much, uh, 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 excuse me, he says, he that is faithful in that which is least is also, um, if I could read, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. What Jesus is saying is this, he's saying, listen, if you can't be faithful in the little things, you won't be faithful in the big things. But if you are faithful in little things, then you can be faithful in the big things. Things. So we need, to, we need to stop and look at our life and say, hey, am I being faithful in the little stuff? Am I being faithful in every area and aspect of my life? And again, remember, the only person you fool is yourself. Because people know if you're faithful or not. God knows if you're faithful or not. So stop and begin to listen and begin to look and begin to consider, am I being faithful with everything that I have? And is there an area where maybe I have been unfaithful in? 
And what can I do to begin to be faithful in this part of my life? Be faithful. I want you to understand that as we are trying to be faithful, we find the admonition in Scripture that we are to also be looking for other people who are faithful. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, he said that that which you have received of me, commit to faithful men who can teach others also. Paul is creating this principle or teaching this principle that we are to be poured into by others while also pouring ourselves into others. And I want you to notice that he said that the kind of people that do this are faithful people. Paul says, listen, you need to be looking for faithful people in your life. And I believe that this is twofold. Number one, you need to be looking for some faithful people that can pour some things into you to help you be faithful. We got several young couples, some that have just gotten married. Well, one couple, this is their first Sunday at church, is Mr. and Mrs. We got some other couples in about two weeks or less are going to be married. What God is telling us, we understand this is just one example or one, one area. We're to be faithful in that relationship as husband and wife. You want to know one of the best things you can do? Young couple, go find somebody that has exemplified faithfulness as husband and wife. And let them pour some things into you to help you know how to be faithful to one another. Maybe you struggle with some faithfulness in your finances. Find somebody that has been faithful in that area. I've got a guy that, that, that recently, I've had some, some struggles there, and, and, and a man in our church has come along beside me and is helping me learn how to be faithful when it comes to the resources God has put in my hands. Paul says, find faithful men. Let them pour into you so they can show you how to be faithful. But not only that, you, if you're faithful, especially in an area, go find somebody that you can pour yourself into. Maybe it's a young couple. Maybe it's somebody struggling with, a, with an addiction problem. Whatever it might be that you identify and say, you know what, I'm going to go help teach somebody how to be faithful in this area of life. How to be faithful in their walk with the Lord. And, and understand, as we are looking for others who are faithful, and we are coming alongside them, and they're coming alongside of us. We strengthen one another to be faithful children of God in a dark, evil world. And as we are faithful, understand that, there, that, that faithfulness comes with reward. Faithfulness comes with reward. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 20. The scripture says that a faithful man shall abound with blessings a faithful man shall abound with blessings so there, there is there is temporal reward on earth for being found faithful you know what happens when you are faithful at home you know what the reward is you have a blessed marriage you know what happens when you are faithful with your finances on earth doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a, a billionaire. But it means you're going to have security and contentment. Right? There's reward to being faithful. Earthly reward. But there's also heavenly reward. Going back to the talents in Matthew 25. When the master came, he says, listen, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He says, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He's saying, listen, when, when, when you are faithful on earth, God's going to bless you even more in heaven. The Apostle Paul talks about the same thing. He said, henceforth there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. Why? Because he was faithful on earth. Faithfulness carries 
reward with it. And unfaithfulness always carries consequence. And so when we are faithful in all things, we are reflecting Christ to those that are around us. Because people are looking for a faithful man. They're looking for faithful women because they are hard to come by, especially in our culture today. People are looking for someone that is faithful. And when they find someone that is faithful, they will ultimately begin to ask the question, Why are you this faithful? And what does your life point back to? It always points back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am faithful because He is faithful. And I reflect His image to those that are around me in faithfulness. So I want to challenge us this morning that we be faithful. That when people look at you, they look at you and say, you know what, there's a guy, there's a gal that is just faithful in all that they do. When they find that you're faithful, you know what's going to happen? They're going to come to you. They're going to have a need. They're going to have a problem. They're going to have a difficulty. And guess who they're coming to? They're coming to you. Why? Because they know you'll be faithful to them. And you will point them to the truth and to the hope that you have whose name is Jesus. So be faithful. Father, we thank you today to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for the example you've set to us in your faithfulness to us, that you are faithful in all things. God, help us to realize our call to be faithful. Help us to realize that others are always looking at us to determine whether we are faithful or not, just as we are doing to them. And Father, when they see us, help them to see faithfulness in us. God, help us to realize today that you're looking as well. Lord, help us to quit playing games this morning and to just be found faithful by you. Lord, we ask now that you meet with us, that you would encourage us, that, God, we would make commitment and decision for you to be a faithful people in an unfaithful world. Lord, meet with us now in Jesus' name as you stand to your feet. I want to invite you to come to this altar of God who spoke to your heart. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Friend, I want you to know that's kind of the, the first step in truly being faithful is coming to Jesus for salvation. If you have never trusted Him, I want to invite you to come that we can take the Word of God and show you what it means to know Him as your Savior. Maybe there's an area of your life today that you're struggling in, that you've been unfaithful in. Maybe it's a marriage or a child relationship or a financial situation. If God has spoke to you, I want to invite you to come. You need somebody to pray with you. We have folks here that will do that. Or you can pray on your own. Maybe there's some other need. Whatever it is, I invite you to come. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body Tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. And oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our 
God And on the third At break of dawn The Son of Heaven Rose again Oh, trample death Is your sting The angels roar For Christ the King And oh, praise the name Of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name Forevermore, for endless days, we will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. We shall return in robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night and will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face and oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his Forevermore, for endless days, we will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For in this days we will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Be seated. We have our video now since the Pastor Kaler closed us out in a word of prayer. Great to see you this morning. I do want to encourage you, I'm sure it's on the announcements, but please join us tonight uh, for our community uh, worship and prayer service. It's something we do every year. There's going to be a multitude of churches gathered in here tonight uh, praising the Lord and praying together for our community. Please, please join us. I promise you it's going to be a powerful, powerful night, and we hope you'll be here with us. Here are your Central Baptist announcements for the week of February 19, 2023. Community Prayer and Praise, Sunday, February 19th at 6 p.m. Lunch with Billy at Shrimp and Stuff Galveston, Monday, February 20th. The bus will leave at 10.30 a.m. Escape Testimony Service, Wednesday, February 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Followed by a fellowship meal. A week from tonight, Ladies Breakfast and Craft Day, Saturday, February 25th at 9 a.m. Sign up in the back. $25 for the craft supplies due by February 19th. The inspiration will be Sunday, February 26th at 6 p.m. Work days are here Saturday, March the 4th at 9 a.m. Landscaping. And on Sunday, March the 5th at 2 p.m., Spring Cleaning and Special Projects. No p.m. service. Aspire Women's Conference will be Friday, March 31st at 7 p.m. Sign up in the foyer. The tickets will be $20 due by March 19th. Mark your envelope, Aspire. This has been your announcements for the week of February 19th, 2023. Father, we love you and thank you for uh, bringing us here today, uh, Lord, to just worship you in song, uh, to hear our pastor as he brings brings your word to us, Lord. I just thank you so much for uh, the service today, Lord, and just ask that now that you go with us, watch over us, and keep us safe, Lord, as we come back tonight, Lord, and worship with our community. 
Father, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Your teenagers are in the uh, fellowship hall.